Okay, this is lecture number 14 for Thursday, May 14th for the French Revolution class. We're going to talk about the terror. Uh, and for a lot of people who study the French Revolution, the terror is sort of the center piece of the French Revolution. It's the thing that defines the French Revolution. Um, and in a lot of ways that is correct, although the French Revolution was much longer than the terror and much bigger than the terror. Um, but the terror was this moment where France seemed to sort of lose its mind. And so I want to talk, the, I, I talked last time about how the, the things that sort of set up the terror were, were several. One was that from the outside, France was facing a war against Austria and Pru Prussia, and then it was joined by England and Spain and, and the Italian kingdoms and then Russia. Um, and so France was feeling, you know, attacked from all sides from the outside, and, and the, the enemies like Prussia had made it clear that they intended to crush the revolution, and that meant punishing revolutionaries. On the inside, 1793 had seen the eruption of uh, the, the Vendée Revolt and the, the Chouans. I haven't really talked about the Chouans, but they were similar to the Vendée. Uh, they, were, they were north of the Vendée. Um, but there were massive revolts in the West that were conservative, Catholic, uh, wanted to return to monarchy, etc. And then in the South, Bordeaux, Marseille, Lyon, uh, Toulon, Toulouse, Marseille, you see um, the, the Federalist Revolt, which was a bunch of cities that didn't necessarily oppose the revolution, but they did not like the way that the central, the, the, the con Constitutional Convention was handling taxes and things like that. And they were very concerned about the uh, the shutdown of major ports uh, for the, by the British uh, in 1793, and they really wanted to have a peace treaty with the British. They didn't want to continue pushing the war. Um, and so these things, the sort of internal revolts against the, the power of the Constitutional Convention and the external threat of war, really set off a process of sort of increasing desperation on the part of the uh, Constitutional Convention, and this desperation was actually added to by the, the, the added threat that the, the, um, the saint culottes in Paris were often physically threatening the members of the Constitutional Convention. The saint culottes actually wanted the Convention to go become more radical, and so the sort of fear generated by the external threat of war, um, the, the revolts by the Vendée and the Federalists, um, coupled with the, the fear of the Saint-Culotte, which was pushing them to be more and more radical, pushed the convention to become more and more violent and more and more willing to just use violence to try to solve the problems of the revolution. So the, those are the triggers for the terror. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, some of the mechanisms, but the first order of business was to put down the Federalist revolts because the the, the Vendée, as much as it was troubling, was a sort of a, a backward region. It wasn't all that important, but Marseille and Bordeaux and Lyon were major cities, and this was a major threat to the uh, revolution. In addition, it was pretty clear that within these cities there was a lot of division. There was a lot of people who supported the revolution. There were a lot of people who wanted uh, things to change, and so there wasn't a, a unanimous support for the Federalist Revolt. It was often that, the, that a few, sometimes even just a few politicians in the city government wanted to revolt against the government, and so they led it that way. Um, so the, the Federalist Revolt, uh, the, the, the Constitutional Convention turned its attention to the Federalist Revolt in the fall of 1793. It, it, be, it took it a little while to get to uh, respond, but then in, by, by August, it was ready to start uh, um, pushing back on the Federalist Revolt. And the first to fall was, was Bordeaux. And on August 6th, Bordeaux, um, basically, the, there, was inter, there were all those internal power struggles within Bordeaux. Um, and, and the real thing that had tipped Bordeaux over into revolting was that the Girondins had been arrested. The, the Girondins in, in in the Constitutional Convention had been arrested, you know, Brissot and, and uh, Roland and et cetera. Um, and, and that had sort of angered a lot of people in Bordeaux, but very quickly, other people in Bordeaux was like, no, this is not a good idea. We don't want to do this. And so uh, on August 6th, Bordeaux actually, in, in, within Bordeaux, they got, they got rid of the Popular Commission, which was the group that had declared their revolt. Um, and they asked the convention to send a representative on mission to come and sort things out. The representative of mission of, of, of arrived in August, on August 19th, 
but there was no the, the representative of a mission didn't have any military force, so he really couldn't do much because he knew that if he pushed too hard, he would find himself facing popular revolts. And so he basically just sat around and waited until um, the military reinforcements showed up in Bordeaux in October, and then the repression began. So, so although the Bordeaux uh, um, revolt was put down fairly quickly, the punishments didn't come until October and November. Um, Marseille and Toulon were a different story. Now, Marseille and Toulon are both in the very south, they're on the Mediterranean. Marseille was a big shipping port at the time. Toulon was, a, was nearby, it wasn't much of a city, but it was a big naval base for the French Navy. Um, and so, uh, in Marseille had revolted, um, and the convention to, uh, sends an, a revolutionary army, which is, the revolutionary armies were really not armies, they were basically hastily armed volunteers, for, often from Paris, who were willing to, who were, who were really devout revolutionaries, who were willing to go and do the dirty work for the revolution. So the revolutionary army shows up um, in, uh, in Marseille um, in, uh, uh, in, in August, and there's what, what's, what happens then is sort of a, 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 a standoff, because within Marseille, um, the, the Revolutionary Army first puts a blockade around Marseille. We're going to cut it off from Paris. But the, Marseille is now kind of stuck because they're revolting against the French government and fighting them, but they're, they're also fighting against the British because the British are against them, and they can't get food from anywhere. And so Marseille begins to split in half. The city government itself and the elites of the city begin to split in half. Half of them want to surrender to the French, to the Revolutionary Army, and half of them actually want to surrender to the British and let the British take the city. Um, and this sets off a fight, and there's actually fighting in late August between the two sides. Um, and uh, in, eventually the, the side that wanted to surrender to the British loses, and they actually flee from Marseille, and they go to Toulon. All right? And they do succeed in forcing Toulon to open up to the British, and so the British take over Toulon. In the meantime, the side that wanted to surrender to the French does succeed, and they surrender to the French, um, and, and so the French Revolutionary Army takes control of the city. Um, now, the, these events in Marseille and Toulon in, in late August set off a kind of a panic back in Paris, because in the Constitutional Convention, losing Toulon, having the British open the port and take over the port of Toulon, was almost like an invasion of southern France by the British, and it, it being helped by French citizens. So this really this really sets off a, a new wave of, oh my gosh, this is all going to hell in a handbasket, kind of hand-waving in Paris in the Constitutional Convention. And in particular, a number of the people, of the leaders of the sans-culottes and the street press, people like Hébert and, and Roux um, and, and Barlet, are really incensed by how Marseille and Toulon was handled. And they really want the government to come down hard on the Federalist Revolt. They want, to, they want to come down hard on everyone they see as a traitor to the revolution. And so, um, on, this, it was actually an interesting thing. There was a, there was a demonstration on September 4th um, in Paris by workers who wanted, were, were agitating for higher wages. Um, but Hébert, who was one of the leaders of the street press and one of the enragés, Hébert organizes, he, he, he starts giving a speech to these guys who are gathered in the Place de Grève, and he says, let's march on the convention. And so they agree to march on the convention, but when they get there, Hébert actually uses this to start saying, we need to, we need to start executing more people for treason to the revolution. And Hébert really puts pressure on the convention um, to put together more revolutionary armies and send them to the south and crush uh, Marseille and, and, and uh, Lyon, etc. Um, and so the, the convention votes immediately to put together another revolutionary army and send it to the south to put down the Federalist Revolt because basically a bear is there and he's got all these thousands of men behind him and the convention is worried they're going to get lynched. So they go ahead and vote for this. They vote for a revolutionary army. Um, and, and one person in the convention actually suggested that each unit of the revolutionary army equipped with a, roll, a guillotine on wheels so they could execute people as fast as possible. That was actually voted down. Um, but the convention also, under pressure from Hébert, <laughs> resolved to pay sans-culottes to patrol the streets of Paris. So they're basically paying the street mobs to be street mobs. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, the Jacobins in the convention are really pushing, they're you know, using Hébert's uh, um, 
pressure to sort of push within the convention and say we need more lo more laws that allow us to combat counter-revolutionary activity. It's everywhere. There are traitors to the revolution everywhere. We have to go find them and, and punish them. So on September 17th, the convention passes the so-called law of suspects. And this is a law that essentially identifies all sorts of people as potential enemies of the revolution and allows for them to be arrested. And so it, it, it spells out, for instance, that aristocrats who haven't shown sufficient enthusiasm for the revolution can be arrested on suspicion of being counter-revolutionary just for that. And, and eventually the law of suspects would be used to arrest people for all sorts of things. Um, you could be arrested for, for not addressing somebody. If you address someone as monsieur, which literally means my lord in French, instead of addressing them as citizen, which is the revolutionary way to do it, you could be arrested as counter-revolutionary. Right? And so the, the, the law of suspects just allows for anybody to be arrested if they're suspected of being counter-revolutionary, but, but the things that count as being suspect keep getting bigger and bigger. So the law of suspects allows for a lot of people to get arrested in a fairly short time. All right. Now, while this is going on, while the Federalist Revolt, they're, they're mobilizing these revolutionary armies to go to, to the south and take on these cities in the Federalist Revolt, they're also mobilizing revolutionary armies to go to the Vendée and to crush that. And so in the late fall of 1793, the, uh, the Vendée Revolt gets put down by a series of revolutionary armies. Um, Actually, I'm gonna, I got ahead of myself. Um, there's, one of the things that's kind of interesting about this period is that the convention is a lot of people. And some of them, like the Jacobins in the mountain, are really, really excited about punishing people for being kind of revolutionary. They're really, they're really pro-revolution. Others are more moderates, and they actually, you know, a lot of people supported the Girondins. They didn't get arrested the way Girondins did, but, but they, they were supporting that position, and they, they, they were a little nervous about this. And after the September 4th um, issue with Hébert threatening the Constitution Convention and bringing all these uh, people to the Constitution Convention and threatening them again, a lot of members of the Constitution Convention began to feel like perhaps... The, the sand culottes and the street crowds were getting out of control. That they were, that they were, they were simply, that they didn't want to have mob rule. They wanted to actually be able to make decisions about how to run the country for free, f freely without being intimidated. And so, and, and even people, Jacobins like Robespierre, were nervous about the sand culottes. The Jacobins were an interesting crowd because they were mostly middle class, but they were fairly radical. And so most of the time they were happy to have the support of the sand culottes, but there were lots of times where the sand culottes were asking for things that they, they didn't really want, right? Because the sand culottes are very much working class, uh, you know, lower, you know, artisans and day laborers and things like that. Um, the Jacobins are much more, you know, the lawyers, et cetera, like that. Um, well, a number of people within the convention decided they needed to push back. They couldn't just let the street crowds, the sand culottes, intimidate them over and over again. So they decided to go, uh, go ahead and attack Hébert. And on, um, and on, um, in October, um, the convention decides that they, they put on an arrest warrant for Hébert and Varlet and a number of these leaders of the street press. And they actually arrest them, uh, Varlet and Hébert. Um, a number of the other ones go into hiding and disappear. But then, um, and, and, and Rue is arrested. Um, and then they, uh, the, con the convention also decides on October 10th, they actually pass, the, that's when they decide to suspend the Constitution of 1793, right? They were, the Constitution of 1793 was really favorable to the San Nicolás. It gave them the vote. Um, it, uh, it had all sorts of provisions for, uh, you know, f food and welfare, etc. Um, the convention was going to implement the, the Constitution of 1793, but they decided to suspend it. And part of that is because they don't want to embolden and give, and give more strength to the sand culottes in the street. Uh, in, in particular, there's some provisions in there that would have allowed the sand culottes to spend more time doing political agitation and less time working. Um, and so... You can see the Constitution is not uniform here. It's not unified. 
There's some who are pushing back against the Santa Claus, some are trying to use the Santa Claus, um, some are want to be more radical, some want to be ra less radical. Um, and so there's sort of a pushback, and, and Rue and Varley are, are, you know, they get arrested, and they would eventually get executed. Um, and, and so the convention has, the, the law of suspects actually gives the convention a lot of power to, and to not only go against counter-revolutionaries, but to start to push back against people that they don't like who are too radical, right? So the law of suspects gives the, con the convention a lot of power. Um, but this really opens the gates, okay, for um, the law of suspects opens the gates for really going after anybody who seems to be uh, not entirely on board with the revolution. And so the late, you know, October, November of 1793, you start to really see um, the, the execution start to step up and it, it, it it, the law of suspects is really, for a lot of people, that's the beginning of the terror, right? Um, September 17th. Now, some people put the terror farther back up, uh, you know, execution of Louis Sixteenth, et cetera, in January. Um, but clearly, by September, the terror has begun. And so you start to see some, a lot of people settling scores, and you start to see a lot of people um, getting arrested under the law of suspects. Um, over the next nine months, between September and July of uh, 1794, September of 1793 to July of 1794, under the law of suspects, about 16,000 people, that's the official number, 16,000 people were arrested and executed in Paris, okay? Uh, or I'm sorry, in, in, in all of uh, France. Um, that's the official number. Historians actually think it's closer to 50,000. Um, just some of these numbers. On October 4th, Marie Antoinette was put on trial for treason. Um, she was executed on October 17th. Um, Brissot, Vagnot, and the other leading Girondins were put on, uh, were put on trial and executed on October 31st. Um, 21 Girondins, which were members of the uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, were executed. Um, and even several who had escaped, like Roland and Petion, um, wound up committing suicide in, in secrecy because they couldn't figure out a way that they could escape being executed and they didn't want to be executed. Um, finally, in, in late October, Lyon surrenders, the city of Lyon, um, and uh, there we're going to see some of the most horrific um, retributions against the Federalist Revolt. And I should say that um, the, way it, the way it worked, that the even in Bordeaux and Marseille, which surrendered fairly early, the, the, the process of arresting and executing people took a while, and it was only in Oct from October and really November and December that you started to see the execution speed up. Um, but Lyon, um, Lyon surrenders uh, after two months siege, so there's two months the Revolutionary Army was sort of sitting outside of Lyon. Lyon finally surrenders, and, and, and at first the representative on mission was a guy named Couton, and I'll talk a little bit more about him. He was a close friend of Robespierre's, or a close associate. But later, there are two other representatives on mission who take over in Lyon. Um, Fouché, and he's an interesting one. You want to keep an eye on him. He's really a fascinating guy. I'll talk more about him in a little bit. But um, Fouché and Collot de Bois take over in Lyon, and they decide that they are really going to make an example out of Lyon. They're going, to, they're going to use terror to scare everybody else in France so much that nobody would dare revolt against uh, the French government again. Um, and so on October, uh, they, they're actually in close conflict with the, the convention back in, in uh, Paris. And you remember that for the convention, they had created this committee, the Committee of Public Safety. And the Committee of Public Safety was basically now the executive branch of the government. It was a committee of nine people, and they were making all sorts of decisions. And the convention had given them all these powers to sort of handle the crisis. And so the convention, the convention was, was sort of letting the Committee of Public Safety handle it. And on, on October 12th, the Committee of Public Safety sends word that they want Lyon to be destroyed. And so Fouché and Colo de Bois, their job is to punish Lyon as hard as possible. They set up revolutionary tribunals, little courts, um, and to try people, and then they just started executing people. They were, there were some days they were killing up to 300 people a day with the guillotine. 
Um, and, and by April, the guillotines were having trouble keeping up, and so they started to just shoot people. Um, and, and here, Fouché comes up with an idea called the mitrailleuse. And this was basically that you would line people up against a wall, and you would take a cannon, and you would load the cannon with a whole bunch of chunks of metal, um, you know, ball bearings and nuts and bolts and screws and nails and any bits of metal, and you would just pack the cannon full of that, and then you would fire the cannon, and the metal would spray out like a shotgun blast, and it would just rip people to pieces. Um, this actually didn't work very well, um, because lots of people wound up just screaming with arms and legs ripped off, and then they had to, and then soldiers had to go through with, with not, uh, so sabers or with pistols and kill everybody individually, which is not very efficient. <laughs> and it was really hor horrifying, because blood and body parts were splatting everywhere, and it really made a lot of people sick. But Fouché was, was, well, liked this a lot, and, and the whole time they were doing this, they were also um, continuing to kill people with the guillotine. Um, so by April, um, 1,800 people would be executed. Um, and in addition, they also decided to burn down most of Lyon. And major portions of the city were simply burned to the ground uh, on purpose. Um, in Bordeaux, at about the same time, 198 people were guillotined as a result of the revolt there. Um, when, when Napoleon takes too long, uh, and, and Napoleon, I mentioned last time, uh, too long gets retaken by Napoleon Bonaparte in December. Um, when Napoleon takes too long, um, 800 people are executed immediately, and then another 289 are, are guillotined over the next several months as they're arrested and, and brought to trial. So that's 1,000 people in Toulon. So we're talking 1,000 here, 1,800 here, you know, several hundred there. Um, but then we get to the Vendée. No, I'm finally getting to Vendée. Um, a revolutionary army marched into the Vendée uh, in, in the late fall. In, in September and October of 1793, and they would fight through until December um, of, of 1793, so, so three, four months. And over the course of that time, the leaders of the Revolutionary Army, in particular a, uh, a representative of a mission named Carrier, um, they decided that they were going to, that, that the problem of the Vendée was not just that some people were revolutionary leaders, it was that everybody in the Vendée was a monarchist and a Catholic, and they decided to basically carry out something close to uh, a genocide. Now, the Vendeans were not without defenses. They had an army of about 60,000 at this point who were ready to fight, but they were not well armed and they were not well organized. Um, and so the, the commander of the Revolutionary Army, a guy named Vesterman, um, he had several battles in October, November, December in the Vendée. And after every battle, he basically told his army to kill everybody they came across who was not a member of their army. And so they were killing men, women, children, etc. Um, after one battle, Westermann's troops killed about 10,000 people. They were still just going through the, the field, and anybody who was alive, they would stab them with a, a saber or shoot them. Uh, anybody. Didn't matter. Um, and so they were carrying out mass murders, essentially. And, and I want to point out that Vendée, as news of these, of these horrific uh, slaughters spread in the Vendée, lots of the peasants began to just run away. They began to follow the Vendean army because they thought it was their only protection against being killed by Vesterman's troops. So when Vesterman did destroy the Vendean army, there were all these women and children and families of the Vendée soldiers there, and they all got slaughtered too. Um, it took until mid-December for Vesterman to finally destroy the last of the Vendean army. But then, Carrier, the, uh, the representative on mission, he sets up a court, and he's going to go and find anybody that had anything to do with the Vendée. He's going to have them arrested, and he's going to execute them. And so over the course of the next several uh, months, um, in Nantes, which is a city just south of the Vendée, Carrier has, there's 3,548 death sentences handed down, 3,500 death sentences. Um, and, this, and this would have taken so long um, that Carrier decided that he was going to come up with a new way to kill people, which is called the Noyades. He, he, what he did is he, the Loire River goes right out, the Nantes is right on the Loire River um, and, the, and the Atlantic. And um, 
So what he did is he would put all, he'd take all the suspects that were supposed to be executed, he'd tie them up, uh, and then he would throw them into a big barge, and then he would sink the barge in the middle of the river. These were called the noyades, the drownings. Um, so overall then, if you look at the aftermath of, you know, this thing that starts with the, the law of suspects in September, goes through the putting down of Federalist Revolt, goes through the Vendée, all the people getting arrested in Paris and elsewhere. Um, it's, it, it looks like at least 500,000 people were arrested at some point during the terror. Um, historians estimate that at least 10,000 died in prison awaiting trial because they were, there was disease, etc. in the prisons. Um, there were lots of, you know, we don't know how many thousands of people were killed by mobs because it was fairly common for San Colot to kill suspects. Um, the guillotine in Paris was running on overdrive, and as I said, there were probably 50,000 people killed um, overall. Um, so the terror was really kicking into high gear. And one of the things to re remember about this is at this point, the terror, the, this, the terror really has a couple of different phases. And this phase from the law of suspects until early in 1794, this phase is kind of a frenzy of killing. I mean, the, the mitrayas, the noyas, they're, they're really just trying to kill people as fast as they can, and they're not really being very concerned about who's getting arrested and who's not. And there's sort of a sense of just lashing out and killing anybody who seems to have any opposition to the revolution. So it's kind of a chaotic version of the terror. All right, now I want to talk about one other aspect of the terror. Something is going on at this point, which is kind of an interesting side note, and that is the de-Christianization movement. Um, and, and the central figure here is a guy named uh, Fouché. Um, Fouché was the guy up here who had thought of the mitrailleurs putting all the grape shot and cannons and blowing people away that way. He's a representative on mission. Um, Fouché is also the key guy in um, in the uh, the dechristianization movement, Fouché was actually before the French Revolution. He was he was studying to be a Jesuit, um, and he was ordained as a priest. So he was a, he was a devout Catholic. But when the revolution comes along, he really decides that he's going to um, uh, he's going to embrace the revolution, and he ultimately decides that the the biggest obstacle to the revolution. He's from the Vendée region. So he decides that one of the biggest obstacles of the revolution is Catholicism, is Christianity itself. He says the religion itself has to go. And he's, he's really a sort of a, a fervent a fanatic for the idea that reason and religion are totally opposites. And so if reason is going to win, religion has to be completely destroyed. Um, and so um, initially, one of the first places Fouché was sent, as a, he, he gets elected to the National Assembly or the Constitutional Convention, and he's sent out as a representative on mission, um, he gets associated with the Jacobins. And one of the first places he's sent is a, is a region of central France called the Nièvre. And in 17, September of 1793, he's in Nièvre, and he, he decides that he's actually going to not just attack the church in Nièvre, he's going to try to eradicate the church. So he, he creates a new religion he calls the Cult of Brutus, named after one of the people who stabbed Julius Caesar to death. And, and he basically, the Cult of Brutus is this thing that's focused on Roman civil virtues, the, uh, the sort of virtues that a Roman citizen was supposed to have, and it sort of celebrates this sort of stoic heroism, etc. And, and the idea is that he's going to create this religion with all sorts of rituals and ceremonies and holidays and all this stuff, to, to replace Christianity. Um, he, uh, he hated the idea of celibacy in priests, and so he actually forced priests in Nieva to get married or to at least adopt children so that they would, they would have a family. Um, he, uh, he declared that France had only one religion, universal morality, which is based on reason, he said. Um, and he also said that, I mean, he he denied that there was an afterlife. And so one of the things he did is he forced all the cemeteries in that region, the F, to put up signs over cemetery gates saying, death is but an eternal sleep. And so, Fouché really starts this idea that Christianity is an obstacle to revolution, that the revolution cannot succeed as long as Christianity is still a, is still a going religion. And so it sets up this, this open confrontation, a fight to the death, so to speak, between Christianity and the revolution. 
Um, now, Fouché would actually go on from there in November. He would leave Nievre, go to Lyon, and start carrying out the mitrailleuses. Um, but one of his colleagues from Nievre takes, goes back to Paris directly, and he brings back this idea of dechristianization. He brings back the idea from Fouché that it's time to attack Christianity. And so this begins to pick up speed um, back in Paris then. In particular, you recall that the Constitutional Convention has representatives from all over France who got elected and came to Paris for the Constitutional Convention. But the Paris Commune, which is the government of the city of Paris, the Paris City Hall, so to speak, had been taken over by the, the Danton and the Sainte-Culottes um, back on August 10th when they overthrew the monarchy. Um, the Paris Commune was really a really radical place at this point, and they, they take up the, the de-Christianization movement. They just take it up whole st lock, stock, and barrel. They love this idea. And they start to attack everything having to do with re religion. They actually... Um, they outlaw priestly vestments. Priests can't wear clothes that identify them as priests. Um, they, uh, any street that was named after a saint, they renamed or they eradicated the word saint from the name of the street. Um, this, the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, this huge uh, you know, Gothic cathedral, had, had statues of a bunch of saints on the front of it. They actually beheaded all of the saints uh, statues. Um, and in fact, uh, about 15 years ago, in a farm field outside of Paris, they actually found the heads that had been cut off of all the statues in the, uh, at Notre Dame. Um, priests began to get denounced for a lack of civil uh, loyalty, and, and under the law of suspects, priests began to get arrested right and left. Um, and, and remember, at this point, the, the church is actually a branch of the French government. Right, because the priests who were still operating had taken a low oath of loyalty to the French government, and a lot of them weren't even really Catholic, but they're still going after them because they represent religion. Right. Um, most of the bishops of Paris resigned and and said we're, they're no longer associating with Christianity whatsoever. Um, and then on November tenth, the the city of Paris renamed Notre Dame Cathedral as the Temple of Reason. And they had a big parade, and they hired an actress to be Reason. And, uh, and they had this big parade in the end of the temple, and they consecrated the temple to Reason um, and, and deconsecrated it as a Christian church. Um, now, a lot of people in the convention were actually not that happy about this. They really didn't like the dechristianization movement. Um, and the reason was that for, people, for anyone who's taking a sort of a larger view of the situation, they recognize that most of France is Catholic, and you cannot tell them that they have to choose either Catholicism or the revolution because they're going to pick Catholicism, and then you, they will not support the revolution. Whereas if you don't set up this argument, if you don't have this fight, it was lots of Catholics would have supported the revolution as long as it's not opposed to Christianity. So Robespierre actually gets up um, on November 21st in the Jacobin Club, and he, he denounces the, the de-Christianization movement. He says, this is too radical. This is crazy. This is going out on, you know, this is nuts. Um, and, and he actually argued, he made the argument that morality cannot be based on religion, or reason rather. Morality has to be based on a belief in a God. And so he basically is making the argument, and again, I should point out he's following Rousseau here and, and even Voltaire. Um, he's making the argument that Morality requires a belief in a divine figure. Now, he's not necessarily endorsing Christianity, but he is endorsing religion. So he doesn't like the whole cult of reason idea because there's no God in that. Um, and so Robespierre would actually, um, uh, well, he, he tries to push back against the, the de-Christianization movement. And in response to that, the Paris Commune closes every church in Paris. They, they legally shut down every church in Paris and say they can't open um, and in response to this, um, I mean, I should point out that by this point, by late November, about 20,000 priests had been, had been renounced their vows and, and stopped practicing and being priests, and 6,000 of them have actually gotten married. Um, some of them were forced to get married. Sometimes nuns and priests were forced to get married. Um, but, uh. The convention finally, the convention doesn't like the dechristianization movement, and Robespierre is a big name in the convention, so he finally pushes and, and gets the convention to push back against the, um, the uh, um, 
dechristianization movement. And uh, on December 6th, the, um, the convention sanctions religious freedom. They say people can practice whatever religion they want to, and that doesn't mean that they should be suspects. Um, but also, uh, just before that, on December 4th, they passed the Law of 14 Frimer. Sorry, that's a misspelling. It's a Frimer. Um, the Law of 14 Frimer um, basically says that the Committee of Public Safety has supreme authority in everything having to do with putting down insurrection, uh, police, anything like that. So it expands the powers of the, of the Committee of Public Safety. Um, and, and it's actually kind of interesting because the Law of 14 Frimer sets up a new stage of the terror because... Before this, the terror had been kind of everyone running around and just sort of executing people willy-nilly. The law of 14 Frimer says, no, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to have this under rules, and it's going to be under the Committee of Public Safety. What happens then, though, is that the Committee of Public Safety sets up a mechanism that makes the terror much more institutional and much more efficient, if you will. And so the new phase of the terror, which basically starts in early 1794 and goes through till July 1794, this new phase of the terror is, um, is a sort of an institutional machinery of death. They set up, they streamline the legal system to allow people to have full trials and then be executed. Um, and, and, but, but it actually in some ways doesn't, you know, there's no more noyades and mitrayades. Everybody is nicely executed by the guillotine. Um, but it, it, in some ways it becomes even more terrifying because the Committee of Public Safety really has the power to have just about anybody arrested and, and executed. Um, I want to just mention a couple things in passing. One is you, you see this date, you know, the, the law of 14 Frimer, and you're wondering what the hell is Frimer. Um, and what is 14? That's actually a date. Um, one of the things that happened in 1793 was that the, the Constitutional Convention had done a number of things that, that were sort of interesting on one level. One is that they had, they had gotten rid of the old weights and measures system. They had introduced the metric system. They said this was a, a, a sort of universal reason, a, a system based on universal reason. It was entirely rational. It was based on tens. It was uh, none of this, you know, 12 inches to a foot kind of thing. Um, and so the metric system was adopted as the official system of weights and measures for France and, and eventually got adopted by the rest of Europe, uh, except England for a long time. Um, and then um, they also adopted a new calendar. And the new calendar had, um, it had, uh, it was set up with um, 12 months of 30 days each. Each day was exactly 30 days. And each month was actually named not for, you know, a Roman emperor. The month of August is named after Caesar Augustus. The month of July is named after Julius Caesar. Um, and, and it's not, it's not named after, um, you know, it's, it's not named after, um, you know, March or, or you know, is, is uh, well, doesn't matter. It's not named after a bunch of you know, gods or Greek mythology or anything like that, which is what our months are named after. Um, instead, what they did is they named the months after the seasons and what was going on. And so, um, you, you know, you had uh, the July, but they didn't correspond, the months didn't correspond exactly to January, February, March, April, because what they did actually then was they had, you might have noticed, you know, 12 months of 30 days each leaves you with 360 days in a year. So they had actually had a five-day sort of festival week at the end of the year that wasn't part of any month. Um, so the months don't quite line up with the, uh, with the months of the old calendar. But they named them after, you know, like, for instance, November, the month is roughly November, was called Brumaire, the month of fog. And, the, and then you had Germinal, the month when, when everything germinates, and you had... You had Thermidor, the month when everything was hot, and 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 so um, and you had Ventose, the month when everything was windy, and so Frimer is is um, is uh, um, December, early December, of you know the cold months, um, and uh, so you'll see a number of things, and and when um, the the new calendar also started over, and it started with year one, uh, 1793 is year one. Uh, etc. And so from this point onward, it gets kind of confusing, gets rather confusing, gets really confusing actually, 
because what, every date has every every day from this point onward has a date like 14 Freemare, and we're like, well, what the heck day is that? You have to do a, this elaborate calculation to figure out that you know that was actually uh, December 4th, 1793, right? Um, and and you're gonna and the next constitution we're getting at is gonna be you know the constitution of the year two you know two and then the you know et cetera et cetera um, and so it gets kind of crazy um, and the, the old calendar it finally brought back after the fall of Napoleon but um, but we're kind of stuck with it for the rest of this so this is the first part of the terror the 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 sort of frenzied bloodlust of putting down the Vendee, putting down the Federalist Revolt, and, and the, the law of suspects allows all sorts of people to be arrested and put on trial for being counter-revolutionary. Um, and, and this sort of frenzied period, um, there emerged a really powerful faction, Fouché, Collet d'Herbois, um, Carrier. These guys came to be called the terrorists. They were the ones who, as representatives on mission, had carried out the terror all across France. And they essentially became the sort of radical group that wanted more and more terror. We'll see that there's a pushback within the convention by the so-called indulgence, Danton and, and Fabre de Glantine and others. Um, and, and Robespierre kind of gets caught in the middle of this because he, he thinks the, the terrorists had gone a little too far. I mean, it's, it's not systematic enough and it's too crazy. But he also doesn't really like the, the indulgence, and we'll see if the indulgence get wrapped up in their own scandals. And so Robespierre is sort of caught between, but Robespierre winds up essentially going after all of them and sort of making himself a dictator in the process. But we'll see how that happens next time.